How easy is it for you, the consumer, to choose ethical products? How easy is it for businesses to ensure their supply chains are sustainable, as we've just been talking about? Well, ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance Principles, have become the buzz acronym for companies wanting to demonstrate their social credentials. But Australian Ethical, one of the country's most successful ethical fund managers, has, says, has said that it's become too easy for companies to self-identify as ethical and is calling on the government to accelerate the development of a labelling scheme. Well, for more on this, we're joined by founder of sustainable fashion platform, The Wardrobe Crisis, Claire Press. It's great to see you, Claire. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Let's talk about, on the buy side to begin with, consumers. Do they really want to be ethical? Do they care about these humanitarian issues? I think maybe the first question is, do they know? I mean, when we're looking, for example, at the story that's just run, I think that most people haven't made the connection yet between modern slavery and what they're wearing. Um, I've yet to meet anyone who said to me, well, I would love to wear a garment sold, sewn by child labour or made from cotton tainted by modern slavery. Mm. So, of course, consumers care, um, but I think that there's not enough transparency on how things are made. And actually, I don't, I don't think people are really across this. I've never done a vox pop in the street on this, but mm. if I did, I bet you'd find that, well, they might be aware of this, uh, this, this huge topic of modern slavery now coming out of Xinjiang. Do they know that it might actually be the shirt on their back that is tainted with this? Yeah, I, I don't um, know. Do you think, maybe, think so. Do you think some are maybe just turning a blind eye because they can get a pack, five pack of underpants for $10? Look, um, whenever we're talking about ethical and sustainable fashion, we have to be talking about price. Mm. And generally speaking, it's going to cost more. Um, mm. And of course, people are motivated by price, and that makes sense. But I think beyond that, there are plenty of studies that show that consumers say one thing, but they do another when mm. it comes to making their purchasing decisions. And the most recent one that I saw was from a German e-tailer, and they'd, they'd surveyed something like 2,500 consumers in various European countries who'd said that 60% of them cared about transparency, but then only 20% of them said they ever looked into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were similar numbers around uh, asking how much do you care about what's in your clothes and what your products are made from. OK, something like 58%. But then how many of you actually look at labels regularly? And mm. that was similar numbers. Mm. So I think that it's a, complicated, it's a complicated story, but I do believe that customers care. I believe that brands have a responsibility to be way more transparent about what's going on in their supply chains. And the last point I would make is that it's not just customers who don't know what's happening here, it's brands. Yeah. I mean, it's, supply chains are, as has mentioned before, so opaque and so long that actually many, many brands have no idea what's happening right back to tier one. Yeah, can you tell us a bit about that process? I know that you've looked extensively into our supply chains and just how opaque they, they are. How difficult is it for some businesses? Well, first of all, I don't think we should make excuses. Brands have a responsibility to be to do good business and to do ethical business. So I don't think we should let them off the hook. However, um, since the 90s, when production, fashion production has moved offshore, mostly to low-cost production places such as Bangladesh or Cambodia, first China, but that's now becoming more expensive, um, supply chains have become longer and much, much more opaque. And as was mentioned before, you're not, it, it's very difficult to trace back to the farm, for example, if you're talking about cotton, in some cases. But, you know, I also do want to say that the tools are there. Uh, for example, developments with blockchain technology. And there are some amazing companies here that are really kind of innovating in, in fibre tracing. So it's possible. But I think brands have been getting away, perhaps, for too long with being able to say, well, we don't really know. And I also think that when it comes to the cotton story that... I mean, when all of this surfaced with regards to the fashion industry around July last year, reports were that virtually the whole industry was complicit in this. And we mentioned before brands such as H&M and I think Nike and certainly Zara. But in fact, Patagonia was on that list of brands that um, the End Forced Labour Coalition um, and for us, we get Labour Coalition published. Mm. And Patagonia is a leader, you know, they were founders of the Fair Labour Association. They've been pioneers in supply chain transparency and tracing. And yet they also were complicit in having these products that 
most likely contained cotton that was tainted with forced labour. Mm. We heard about in the introduction there that it's, uh, it can be often, well it's been labelled, that it's been too easy to make these ESG claims or these green claims as a business. So I guess that speaks to the, the regulation of, of the sector. But mm. do you think, given if it is a bit loose and a bit opaque in not just supply chains, that some of the re retailers are kind of cashing in on this woke society? Ah, look, um, greenwashing is a huge issue in the fashion industry and outside of fashion in all product categories, I think. Um, when something becomes very buzzworthy, marketers jump on it, we know that there's this increased interest in sustainable and ethical or eco. And of course, that means that brands want to promote products that they can describe in that way. But I think the problems arise when we don't have traceable and verifiable certifications and standards behind these products. And so for the consumer, I would encourage them to look for those certifications and standards and look for verifiable labels rather than marketing claims or mm. you know a lovely slogan or a hashtag. Mm. And, and it is there if you want to look for it. One thing I would say is though that uh, it's not that easy. We're actually asking consumers who mm. are primarily driven by convenience, price and desire to actually go out and do homework. And I think that while that's the case, we're going to have a real problem because who's actually going to stop while they're browsing for clothes and start yeah. checking, has this brand got you know, verifiable credentials of doing good work when it comes to looking after the humans in their supply chain. Mm. I think it's a big ask. Mm. Michael, I know you recently uh, bought yourself some jeans. Did you did. employ, you know, convenience, price and desire in your research there? Well, I um, found in the middle of the lockdown, Melbourne's lockdown last year, that um, all my jeans had, you know, holes in their knees. And uh, I know that's fashionable in, in certain <laughs> age groups, just but not Mine got tighter mine. during COVID, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I decided to buy some jeans online. And normally I buy Levi's in a store. And I, I read an article about um, the exploitation of garment workers. Um, I think it was, in, it was actually in Sri Lanka. Um, so I went online and did some research on Levi. And to my surprise, I found that Levi is actually one of the most socially responsible mm. companies, uh, bar none. Mm. Um, they make, the, the jeans we get in Australia are made in Indonesia. I found a report by an independent human rights organization that assessed that Levi um, was a very fair employer and during their lockdown had provided job, job security. So it, mm. you, know, I, you don't always have the time to do that. But it certainly um, reassured me that buying a pair of Levi jeans uh, was not an unethical thing to do. <laughs> I but wish I would more... add to the comment about cost. Mm. I can afford to pay a premium uh, for mm. ethical products. Um, you can compare it with uh, organic food. You know, people on very low incomes can't afford organic right. food. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it might be the same for ethical clothing. Um, so yeah. you, it's, it's going to be very challenging for for them. Claire Press, I know you wanted to jump in there. Ed, did Michael do his research well? I did he find <laughs> did he find the facts or did he buy a marketing story? Actually, I think he's, he's right. They are one of the companies that are leading on this. But I, I, was, I just wanted to interject and say that it's very uncommon. Most people don't do that. And I wish more people did and spent the time to really research mm. how their clothes are made and what's going on behind the scenes in fashion supply chains. But, but they really don't. And so it comes at the end of the day down to brands taking real responsibility mm. for what's going on in their supply chains. And I think we also do need stronger regulation to ensure that it's not just a voluntary thing yeah. and that they will be held accountable if they don't do that because the buck stops there. You know, you're the brand. You may well say, well, I, I don't know. It's difficult. Mm. I'm sorry. It's not good enough. You have no. to know you're in business. So uh, from a business perspective, <laughs> Amanda, mm. I mean, do businesses care? Do T-shirts need to have a conscience? Does business mm. have to be political or is it just an unavoidable reality? Well, it'd be nice if we didn't have to regulate morality. Um, mm. simply just doing the right thing in business. I think, again, like I mentioned before, a lot of companies uh, chase the money. 
too much, you know, like increasing profits every year instead of being steady and understanding that you're feeding families by paying the right people the right amount and that you're giving your consumers what is it they want, they give them, they can sleep at night knowing they've helped other people with buying that purchase. I do believe a lot of people do things, tick the box and promote, look at us, we're ethical and it isn't the consumer's responsibility to go and find out whether they are or not. But there is a change, so there is a wave of people, um, and I would say the next generation, a couple of generations uh, down, asking questions and only buying places that the word of mouth or through their friends saying that's mm. helping a small community. So a lot of small businesses are benefiting from this because instead of buying, say, active wear from a, a main you know, international chain, they'll go to their local markets and say, well, you've made this at home or you've you know, supplied, you know, got your supplies from Australia, I want to buy from you. And only some people can do that, just like it was mentioned, that not everyone can do that. Some people do need their $2 T-shirts um, you know, that they buy in bulk and understandable. But again, I know companies that do outsource and get their materials from overseas, but doesn't mean it's unethical either. But in, in fairness... Um, I would say that we're dealing with a systemic problem here and that um, you're absolutely right that we can choose to support local um, ethically accredited, Ethical Clothing Australia, for example, is a great accreditation body that we have here. And that, that's fantastic. However, we're talking about tier one, which is cut and sew. We don't really make any, I mean, I'm sure there are some examples, but generally speaking, we are not manufacturing textiles in Australia. Obviously, we grow yes. a lot of wool, we grow cotton too, but we export mm -hmm. it to mm. be manufactured and at the mills level. And so actually, this is a systemic problem. Mm. And even if you're a small brand, you can't be guaranteeing that the fabric that you use is completely ethical right back down to the farm, as we've seen from the story that was just aired there. So I think also I think that brands are filled with people trying with good intentions. Mm -hmm. these, it's not like these... these companies are staffed by demons who no, but don't I, care. But I do think profits, the system, profits over people is a huge problem and by saying that they all care yeah. and, is and a generalisation. And that's generalization. an interesting point that you bring up there Amanda because Claire we know that there are some examples of large chains globally who are kind of doing their best but they're being bitten by their largest customer base so I, I believe that there's a story about H&M in China that was calling out uh, some of the work but that's a very large proportion of their client base. Well, I think whenever you take a stand on something like this, then, of course, you stand to lose um, potentially politically or potentially from a customer-based perspective. And the story that you mentioned when H&M made a public statement around, um, around the Uyghur supply chain cotton issue and said that they would not source or move towards not sourcing from there, um, there was a boycott that happened amongst Chinese consumers, and that happened also with Uniqlo, and, I mean, it's just extremely complicated. Mm -hmm. I think it's another thing to raise is that, um, and we mentioned pa I mentioned Patagonia before, that they made a very clear statement that they were going to exit the region, but also that that takes time, so it can't be done overnight. Mm -hmm. And I think that consumers don't understand that, that so, lead yeah. times and switching a supply yeah. chain can be very difficult. So, uh, um, Claire Harvey, very briefly... <laughs> um, we know that uh, consu Chinese consumers have huge buying power all around the world. You know, would it come to a point where big uh, big business is thinking, w who do I satisfy most? Yeah. The big the big purchases, or do I let them go by the wayside and fulfil this ESG goal? Yeah, there's a really mm. big risk, I think, too, for companies who who do make a public statement about moving their supply chain to sort of ethical as well. I remember a few years ago picking up um, a story which said that Cadbury was about to make dairy milk was was intended to make dairy milk fair trade by like 2025 mm. and which immediately made me put down my packet of dairy milk and think mm. well I'm not going to buy that then mm. Mm. you know so and, and and so then I'm punishing Cadbury for attempting to, to do something to, to well do some reform <laughs> mm. because yeah. it, it literally made a taste it left a bad yeah. taste in my mouth yeah. yeah you know so I think it, it's really hard and this has to be led by not only governments but also the big retailers yes. mm. Walmart uh, uh, organizations like Walmart are, are I think the holy grail yeah. they're the ones who have the, the enormous buying power and the other thing is we didn't grow up with two dollar t-shirts maybe we just need to no. stop and they buying last so much and they did last quite a long time <laughs> yeah. those t-shirts so we, we do we do over they were hideous. <laughs>